the classic sitcom Leave It to Beaver won over audiences during its original run. This nostalgic show offered a heartwarming peek at suburban family life in the 1950s. Ward, I asked you to see that he ate. Uh, eat Beaver. Though depicting wholesome humor and idealized domesticity, Beaver had blunders and little-known quirks off-screen. Join us as we uncover bloopers and some lesser-known facts behind this beloved show. Beaver and the Bloopers. The day was October 4, 1957, and the space age had just dawned as the Soviet Union launched the world's first artificial satellite Sputnik 1 into orbit. Little did Americans know that on this very same day, another notable launch was occurring. The premiere episode of a humble family sitcom called Leave It to Beaver. Though far overshadowed by the dawn of space exploration, this new television show would leave its own important mark on American culture over the next six years. Leave It to Beaver charmed audiences with its lighthearted stories of suburban family life as seen through the eyes of young Theodore Beaver Cleaver. The show provided a cozy and nostalgic escape from Cold War tensions as viewers laughed along with the Cleaver family's daily adventures and misadventures. Leave It to Beaver became a beloved hit, airing 234 episodes over six seasons before ending its run on June 20, 1963. But despite the show's enduring popularity, very few bloopers or outtakes from its original production survive today. The show was filmed on 35mm films, an expensive medium at the time. To cut costs, the physical film reels of any unused or discarded takes were recycled by stripping off the costly silver emulsion coating so the reels could be reused. This stringent thriftiness meant that outtakes containing bloopers or funny moments were erased and lost forever. It's quite unfortunate that behind-the-scenes outtakes showing the cast-breaking character or making mistakes are gone. Modern viewers would undoubtedly delight in seeing the Cleaver family's hilarious blunders and reactions when the cameras weren't rolling. But in the late 1950s, efficiency and cost savings were prioritized over preserving bloopers. So unless a blooper occurred and was left in during one of the final aired episodes, the many amusing mistakes that must have happened during filming appear sadly lost to history. Nevertheless, the show lives on as an emblem of idyllic suburban life in the memories of generations of fans. Mistakes slip into Mayfield. While casual viewers simply enjoy the wholesome stories of the Cleaver family, there are some truly eagle-eyed fans who analyze every minute detail of the show, and these super sleuth beaver devotees have uncovered some delightful bloopers over the years. In the 1963 episode, The Poor Loser, there's a quick establishing shot of June Cleaver in the kitchen glancing at a wall calendar. Seems innocuous, right? But the calendar shows the days of 1961, not 1963 when the episode actually aired. Well, the calendar was meant to show 1963. Apparently, the prop department got so into the Cleaver's perfect retro world that they kept using an old calendar without updating it. An easy mistake to make. That wasn't the only time details got bungled in the otherwise idyllic town of Mayfield. When the show starts, Wally is said to be 12 years old, and Beaver is almost 8, a 4-year age gap. But somehow by the final season, Wally ages 5 years while Beaver ages normally to 14. It seems that the confused calendar led to some fuzzy math for the Cleaver boys' ages. In another episode, Wally's know-it-all friend Eddie claims the novel Two Years Before the Mast was written by Charles Dana. But the problem here? Half of that name was incorrect. The book was actually penned by Richard Henry Dana Jr. Looks like Eddie isn't as smart as he thinks. These temporal slip-ups just add to the show's charm. Things weren't always letter-perfect in the Cleaver household or Mayfield. Fiction and Reality While Leave It to Beaver portrayed an idyllic suburban environment, the show did contain some elements rooted in reality. Scriptwriters Joe Connolly and Bob Mosher drew upon their own early lives when developing storylines. Plot ideas frequently originated from genuine tales of their childhood friend groups, families, neighborhoods, and amusing misadventures. Even actress Barbara Billingsley, who played quintessential mother and homemaker June Cleaver, provided real-world advice on how a parent might react to the antics of Beaver and Wally. As a mother of two sons in real life, she would occasionally give the writers constructive feedback 
if she felt June's reactions seemed unrealistic. According to her, the kid's misbehavior written into the scripts was sometimes not quite large enough to warrant June's strong reprimand or anger. With her own parenting experience, she knew how a real mom might respond. The writers appreciated her input in helping shape June's parenting style and reactions. Adding even further realism was actor Hugh Beaumont, who portrayed all-knowing father Ward Cleaver. Unbeknownst to many viewers, Beaumont was an ordained Methodist minister in real life before becoming an actor. His experience in the ministry imbued Ward Cleaver with a degree of wisdom and integrity, even if Beaumont himself didn't always relate to Ward's great patience and understanding. The realism he brought to the role helped make Ward Cleaver one of the most iconic, wise, gentle TV dads, Jerry Mather's audition. Casting the lead roles for an iconic show like Leave It to Beaver was crucial. Producers needed to find child actors who could convincingly portray typical American boys with authenticity and charm. When young Jerry Mathers came to audition for the role of Theodore Beaver Cleaver, he instantly impressed producers with his honest, unaffected personality and integrity. While Jerry's parents brought him to the studio for the audition, Jerry himself was far more concerned with making it to his scheduled Cub Scout meeting on time afterward. Eager to get the bothersome audition over with quickly, Jerry showed up dressed from head to toe in his official Cub Scout uniform. Even though the uniform was not called for, Jerry wore it as a way to save time changing clothes and maximize his chances of getting to his beloved Cub Scout gathering on schedule. When the producers inquired about the uniform, Jerry politely but matter-of-factly explained he might be late for his scouting function if the audition ran long. He expressed more eagerness to run off to the meeting than interest in the acting role itself. But it was exactly this kind of earnest charm, innocence, and principled honesty that made producers realize they had found the perfect young actor to play the iconic beaver. Jerry's integrity and youthful candor shone through as the embodiment of childhood spirit. He didn't try to impress the adults or put on a phony act. He was simply himself. And that realness was exactly what the role needed. The Cub Scout uniform was just icing on the cake, showing his primary concern was being responsible and involved in an activity he loved. There was no pretense or vanity in Jerry's approach to the audition. Producers knew that kind of natural, humble temperament would help make Beaver feel like a real, relatable American kid. And the rest is television history, Wally and the Beaver. When developing a new television show, creators typically go through rounds of brainstorming before landing on the perfect title. Leave It to Beaver was no exception. While today, it's impossible to imagine the sitcom being called anything else. Earlier in development, the show almost received a different name entirely. Originally, creators Joe Connolly and Bob Mosher were considering naming the show Wally and the Beaver. This working title for the new sitcom focused on the brother dynamic between the two Cleaver sons, highlighting eldest brother Wally, along with the mischievous but lovable younger brother, nicknamed the Beaver. The idea of emphasizing Wally's role and perspective as well as the Beaver's probably stemmed from the fact that early in development, the show was envisioned primarily as a comedy about an all-American nuclear family. Wally and the Beaver's brotherly camaraderie and adventures would be a major focus, though still framed within the context of family life in general. However, once the pilot episode titled It's a Small World aired on television, it became abundantly clear audiences were particularly enamored with Jerry Mather's portrayal of the innocent, curious beaver. His antics and point of view drove much of the plot and affable humor. After seeing the reception to the pilot, producers realized the heart of the show was really the lovable rascal beaver, not necessarily the dynamics between the two brothers. The name Wally and the Beaver felt outdated already, since the Beaver character was emerging as the true star. The show needed a new title to reflect the prominence of the Beaver and focus on his amusing escapades. And so, after testing the waters, Leave It to Beaver was born. The iconic name better captured the comedic spirit of the series that lay ahead. It's a small world. Before being picked up as its own standalone sitcom, the pilot episode of Leave It to Beaver first aired on television as part of an anthology series called Heinz Studio 7. Anthology shows typically feature a different story with new characters in each episode, similar to The Twilight Zone, 
or Alfred Hitchcock Presents. For the 1957 summer season, Heinz Studio 57 aired various pilot episodes of potential shows to gauge which might merit being made into a full series. Leave It to Beaver's pilot episode, It's a Small World, debuted among these tryout pilots on April 23, 1957. Even though the Cleaver family and Mayfield setting would soon become icons, at the time they were just another potential new show among many piloting on Studio 57. The pilot introduced audiences to the Cleaver family, including young actors Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow. While the central premise was similar to what Leave It to Beaver would become, the pilot did contain some key differences. The name itself, It's a Small World, hinted at the perspective of seeing quaint community life through a child's eyes that Leave It to Beaver would adopt. However, the character dynamics were not yet defined. In fact, a young Harry Shearer who later found fame on The Simpsons has a minor role in the pilot as a friend of Wally's. After the pilot aired, executives decided Beaver's adventures warranted being expanded into a full series. The rest is history. So while today, we immediately associate Leave It to Beaver with its own standalone sitcom, its humble beginnings first started within the context of a short pilot on the anthology show Heinz Studio 57. The recipe clearly seemed promising to television producers even in its early stages. Barbara Billingsley Fashion Statement Barbara Billingsley became America's quintessential TV mom with her portrayal of June Cleaver on Leave It to Beaver. Her immaculate dresses, pearl necklaces, and perfectly coiffed hair created an iconic image of 1950s suburban motherhood. However, her always fashionable attire served practical purposes beyond just looking prim and proper on screen. As the actors playing her on-screen sons Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow aged and grew taller during the show's six seasons on the air, Barbara faced a unique challenge. She didn't want to appear shorter than the boys on camera as they sprouted up inch by inch. So she took matters into her own hands, or rather, her own feet. Billingsley deliberately started wearing increasingly high heels in her role as June Cleaver to remain taller than her TV sons as they went through growth spurts. Rather than trying to conceal or downplay the boy's growth, which might seem unrealistic, she used fashion as a clever trick to help her keep pace. The higher heels allowed her to maintain the physical appearance of a mother still taller than her two sons, even as they matured. Billingsley also employed some camera tricks at times, standing on a small platform behind tables or counters to gain an extra few inches of height. But primarily, she relied on heels to remain the queen bee of the Cleaver household throughout changes in her co-star's heights. Her fashionable solution helped preserve the authenticity of the family dynamic visually. The infamous toilet scene. In 1957, television was still a relatively new medium figuring out its standards and taboos. Showing something as mundane as a toilet was considered highly inappropriate and vulgar. Against this backdrop of conservatism, Leave It to Beaver broke new ground in just its second episode, Captain Jack, by featuring the very first toilet ever shown on a television series. In the episode, Wally and Beaver order an alligator from a catalog and then have to find somewhere in the house to secretly keep it. Of course, the logical place is inside the toilet tank. While tame by today's standards, at the time showing an actual toilet on TV, let alone plot lines about using one to hide pets, was completely unheard of. The network CBS was initially very reluctant to allow it at all. But the producers stood firm that there was simply no other plausible place in the house where the boys could conceal an alligator. After tense discussions, a compromise was reached. The episode could show the toilet tank, but not the bowl itself. So in one quick scene, Wally is shown lifting the tank lid off, placing the alligator inside. Only the top back half of the toilet is visible, but that was enough to break the stigma. Despite only showing part of it, Leave It to Beaver smashed television taboos by being the very first scripted series to showcase an actual toilet on screen. It paved the way for humor and bathroom scenes which are commonplace today. Hugh Beaumont and the Show While actor Hugh Beaumont convincingly portrayed the quintessential wise patriarch Ward Cleaver on screen, off screen, he had a much more complicated relationship with the show. In fact, due to a devastating real-life family tragedy, 
Beaumont harbored hidden resentment towards Leave It to Beaver for years. Shortly after the show was picked up to series, Beaumont had to abruptly travel from his home in Minnesota to the set in LA to start filming quickly. This left his own family to follow behind driving to California. En route, Beaumont's son crashed the car, killing Hugh's mother-in-law. Beaumont deeply loved his family and was overwhelmed with grief over the loss of his mother-in-law in the terrible accident. Even though it was not directly the show's fault, he irrationally blamed the rushed, last-minute travel arrangements caused by Leave It to Beaver's sudden production demands. The tragedy hung over him for years and tainted his feelings about working on the show. Professionally, Beaumont continued giving his all in the role of Ward Cleaver, which made him famous. But internally, he admitted to feeling resentment and bitterness at the show and the painful family memories attached to it. This personal heartache remained concealed underneath his warm, caring demeanor as America's dad. Low Ratings The journey of Leave It to Beaver was filled with ups and downs along the way to becoming an American classic sitcom. In fact, after the very first season in 1957 to 1958, the show was actually canceled due to poor ratings performance. Hard to believe for a series now considered one of the most beloved family comedies of all time. During that inaugural season airing on CBS, Leave It to Beaver finished in 58th place in the overall primetime television ratings. At the time, if a new show failed to rank in the top 30 programs for the season, it was standard practice for networks to drop them from their lineup. So CBS made the decision to cancel Leave It to Beaver based on its middling rank outside the top 50 shows. The series could have easily faded into obscurity after one season, remembered only as a footnote. Fortunately, rival network ABC recognized the potential of the wholesome family comedy and decided to give it a second chance, purchasing the rights to revive the show. Under new leadership, Leave It to Beaver moved to ABC and switched from airing Friday nights to Thursdays, a better night for family programming. This network change and strategic scheduling adjustment provided just the boost the new sitcom needed. Ratings improved dramatically, propelling Leave It to Beaver into the top 25 shows by its third season. The once nearly cancelled series climbed all the way to number 16 by the time it ended its run in 1963. So a little patience and tweaking by ABC brought out the best in the show. Leave It to Beaver found its groove and cemented its legacy as an American classic, despite an inauspicious start. Where's Mayfield? The idyllic suburban town of Mayfield where the Cleaver family lived was presented as any town, USA, familiar and relatable to all viewers. To cultivate this universal appeal, the exact location of Mayfield was left ambiguous, never pinned down to one specific state in the scripts. But that hasn't stopped fans from theorizing for decades about where the town might be located in real life. Several clues sprinkled throughout episodes have fueled speculation about Mayfield's geography over the years. In one episode, Wally mentions his high school band competing in Madison, potentially placing the town in Wisconsin near the state capital. The Cleavers also take a trip to watch the Green Bay Packers football team, hinting at a possible Wisconsin or generalized Midwestern setting. Yet in another episode, Beaver asks his parents for a surfboard, implying the climate and geography support beaches. So could Mayfield be a coastal California town instead of landlocked in the Midwest? Other clues like the town's name itself and architecture don't definitively point to any region over others. The show's creators actually used aerial shots of real suburban neighborhoods around Skokie, Illinois, when establishing Mayfield in exterior scenes. So certainly there are traces of the Midwest embedded visually. However, the writers intentionally kept the location non-specific in dialogue to allow viewers nationwide to see their own communities reflected in the fictional Mayfield. After decades of hints, clues, and speculation by die-hard fans hoping to pin down an exact location, the town's geography remains officially ambiguous. But this blurring of place ultimately serves the show's underlying goal to represent an idealized American hometown that viewers across the country can embrace as their own. Jokes that got too big of a laugh. Classic family sitcoms often aim for a light-hearted, gentle tone, rather than big belly laughs. Keeping with this approach, the producers and directors of Leave It to Beaver had an interesting philosophy when it came to humor on the show. 
If a joke got too strong of an audience reaction, they would cut it out of the final aired episode. Leave It to Beaver was not intended to be a laugh-out-loud slapstick comedy. The creators wanted tender humor and chuckles to arise naturally from the amusing situations the Cleaver family found themselves in week to week. So during tapings, if certain jokes unexpectedly elicited loud, boisterous laughter from the studio audience, the producers deemed those moments too over-the-top for the show's intended warmth and simplicity. The writers, directors, and producers huddled after tapings to review which jokes worked best and decide what to edit out or leave in the final cut. If a gag provoked too much raucous laughter, they felt it went against the tone and spirit of the show. So those overperforming laugh lines were omitted before the episode made it to broadcast television. Actor Tony Dow, who portrayed Wally Cleaver, confirmed this was standard practice, saying they didn't want a big laugh, they wanted chuckles. Lines or moments that garnered so much response were believed to disrupt the delicate balance of earnest family comedy the creators wished to maintain. Trimming any guffaw-inducing gags kept reactions mild and maintained the show's trademark innocence. So next time you watch, remember all the biggest belly laughs were left on the cutting room floor. The final goodbye. In its sixth and final season in 1963, Leave It to Beaver made television history by becoming one of the first primetime shows to end with a planned series finale bringing closure to the narrative. This was practically unprecedented in the early 1960s when most shows were canceled abruptly without resolution. But the ending of Leave It to Beaver was different, thanks to real-life circumstances. The show went off the air primarily because young actor Jerry Mathers, who starred as the iconic Beaver, wanted to step away from acting and focus on attending high school. With the central character departing, creators were faced with a choice. Attempt to continue the show by shifting focus or treat the sixth season as the end and shape a deliberate finale. They opted for the latter. Mather's desire to quit and the showrunner's eagerness to craft an intentional concluding episode happened to coincide with several other factors that made ending the show organically appealing. For one, the child actors were growing up, Wally was heading off to college and Beaver was entering high school, so their brother dynamic would necessarily change. Additionally, the show told a complete coming-of-age story over six seasons, taking the boys from childhood to adolescence. So with Jerry Mathers ready to move on and the natural character arcs reaching an end point, the stage was set for a conclusive finale. In the last episode titled Family Scrapbook, the Cleavers look back fondly on past memories using an old family photo album. This provided a retrospective look at the show's highlights and growth over the years. Flashback clips gave viewers one last nostalgic glimpse of beloved moments. Leave It to Beaver was the first primetime comedy series to end in such an intentional, satisfying manner that so honored the journey audiences had witnessed. It set a precedent and raised the bar for series finales that followed. The show went out on its own terms when the time was right narratively, a novel concept back in 1963. This extraordinarily well-planned final episode was a first in television history and proved that just because a show is ending doesn't mean fans can't have true closure. Black and White The first two seasons of Leave it to Beaver aired in black and white, which was still typical for TV shows of the late 1950s. However, Partway through the show's run in 1959, new color television technology was gaining popularity. Competing family sitcoms like The Donna Reed Show decided to make the upgrade to color to stay modern. Leave it to Beaver had a choice. Invest more to convert to color filming or continue broadcasting in black and white. After deliberation, the producers intentionally decided to keep the show black and white rather than adopting the new color technology. While this may seem counterintuitive, they had some sensible reasons. Color filming required more expensive film, cameras, and lighting equipment, and cost nearly twice as much per episode to produce. The sets and costumes also would need adjustments to look best on color film. Overall, the budget would balloon, perhaps unsustainably so. The extra demands of color would limit rehearsal time, potentially diminishing performance quality. The producers felt maintaining the integrity of the show and its established style was paramount. The black and white cinematography lent it a classic, nostalgic feel that the creators prioritized keeping. 
They believed investing more in good scripts and acting rather than flashy visuals was a smarter allocation of a limited budget. Absorbing higher costs of color filming would mean less money available for other aspects of production they deemed more important. So despite the trends, Leave It to Beaver stayed committed to its black and white roots until the very end. Their old-fashioned approach helped the show maintain its signature retro charm, enduring popularity. In the aftermath, once Leave It to Beaver ended, the cast members and creators all moved on in different directions. But the show's enduring popularity lived on as new generations discovered it in reruns. And's the fun cast of the show had a fair share of fun behind the scenes after stories. Jerry Mathers attempted to enlist in the U.S. Marine Corps after the show ended, but was turned down. The Marines feared having such a famous star could put them at risk for bad publicity if he were to be injured or killed in combat. Undeterred, Mathers found another way to serve by joining the Air Force National Guard instead. Tony Dow, who played Wally, had the opposite problem. He struggled to land roles after being so identified with the part of Wally. He eventually reinvented himself professionally, finding success as a television director. Dow has expressed gratitude for the opportunities Leave It to Beaver gave him and has fond memories of the show that launched his career. Barbara Billingsley became forever beloved as quintessential TV mom June Cleaver. She embraced her enduring association with the character who represented wisdom, patience, and kindness. Billingsley reprised her role as June Cleaver in the 1980s for a reunion TV movie and spin-off series. Beyond the cast, reruns of Leave It to Beaver have kept the show alive in the hearts of new generations of viewers. Though it went off the air in 1963, the show has never stopped airing in syndication. This consistent rerun presence has allowed audiences young and old over the decades to enjoy the gentle humor and nostalgia of the Cleaver family dynamic. Leave It to Beaver has become deeply embedded into American pop culture as the epitome of idyllic suburban life in the 1950s and early 1960s. Even viewers born long after it ended can immerse themselves in the soothing, simpler world of Mayfield through ageless syndicated reruns. Few classic sitcoms have remained so universally beloved and rerun so steadily over the years. Leave It to Beaver seems destined to maintain its cultural relevance for decades to come. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.